Okay, thanks everyone. Welcome to the Leverhulme Center for Nature Recovery and, and Biodiversity Network uh, seminar series. Um, so I'm Lisa Wedding. I'm an associate professor in the School of Geography and Environment, and I'm a PI of the Seascape Ecology Lab, and I'm happy to step in this week for Yavinda and, and host uh, the network seminar. Um, so I, I'll just say uh, two things before I get into the introduction. So we have uh, two upcoming seminars focused on rewilding. So Friday, the 17th of November uh, at 4.15 again, we have um, Dr. Dr. Sophie Montserrat from Re Rewilding Europe coming to talk about rewilding European landscapes. And then the following week, we have a talk on rewilding, restoration, and the future of nature recovery. Uh, that's again, Friday the 24th at 4.15 as well uh, by James Bullock of the UK Center for Ecology and Hydrology. Um, but this week we've got a marine theme talk, so I'm very happy to see that. Um, and really delighted to welcome uh, Professor Christina Hicks here. So Christina is an interdisciplinary social scientist and a marine conservationist. Uh, she examines interactions between uh, humans and the natural environment. And uh, I had the privilege to overlap with Christina a little bit at, at Stanford University years ago at the Center for Ocean Solutions. So um, it's been great to follow her, her research trajectory on um, small scale fisheries through the years. And now Christina is based at, in the UK uh, at Lancaster University. And she focuses her work on fisheries governance and conservation there, uh, fisheries nutrition, uh, food justice. And her work is, is really centered around a, a focus on coastal um, East and West Africa. So Christina is a highly cited researcher. She's had um, her work published really widely in, in journals such as Nature and Science. Um, you may have seen her featured in some documentaries as well, including the BBC World Service. And she's received a number of grants and awards, including a European Research Council, Leverhulme Trust, and Royal Geographic Society Award. Um, so currently, Christina is uh, working to support just and sustainable food systems. Uh, and uh, she's examining the contributions of fisheries that fisheries make to nutrition under social and environmental change. So today we'll learn a little bit more about that research um, in her seminar on fishing for nutrition. Uh, so let's give Christina a really warm welcome and our attention. Thank you very much, Lisa, for that generous um, introduction and thank you for having me here today. Um, um, yes, yeah, so as Lisa said, I'm going to talk today about fishing for nutrition, healthy people and healthy oceans. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about food systems and fisheries are an often overlooked component of the food system. But I've been fascinated in fisheries for a number of years. They're diverse, they're uh, charismatic, they're um, often not always sustainable. Um, I developed a real love for fisheries when I was working in Kenya and I spent a couple of years traveling up and down the coastline, um, often sitting under trees with mostly other women waiting for the fishermen to come in so I could measure their catch. Um, or I was under the water trying to evaluate how management measures, um, how, how they were affecting the ecology um, and, and benthic life underwater. And this time gave me a really deep belief that fisheries could and should be both able to be sustainable and also provide a dignified life to the communities that depend upon them. So just to give you a brief overview, view of what I'd like to talk to you about today. So I'm going to take a step back and talk about the global food system, where we're at. I'm going to then position the aquatic food system within this global food system and hopefully make the case for why aquatic foods are really important. I'm then going to ask the question of who gets to eat um, and ask that in a number of different ways before looking at what the barriers to access are. Um, and then finally, going to spend a little bit of time trying to think about what policies there are available for change. So, unfortunately, 
food security and malnutrition is a really persistent problem, but it's also worsening. We're in a worse position now than we were in 2015 when we set the Sustainable Development Goal target of zero hunger. So in uh, a couple of years ago, almost 800 million people went hungry. Um, um, and I think, sorry, I need to remember the statistics. 120 million were suffering from acute food insecurity. So our food system is failing people. But at the same time, the ecosystems that our food system depends on are in decline. They're being eroded by processes or patterns of overconsumption, by pollution, and also by climate change. And simultaneously, our food systems are feeding back and undermining or exacerbating these very drivers of overconsumption, pollution, and climate change. So we really need to try and develop a more efficient, a more effective, a more sustainable, and a more just food system. A couple of years ago, a colleague of mine um, took a step back and we asked, well, where, how much food is there? And where is it all going? So we drew on the FAO's data and we teamed up with um, um, some people who do better infographics than I'm capable of. And what I'm gonna show you here, and I'll run through it and you don't need to read it all, but along the top, you've got the different food categories. And these are food categories that the Eat Lancet Commission um, adopted in their 2019 report on a healthy and sustainable diet. The size of the box refers to how much food is produced and at the bottom here, let me do this one, sorry. At the bottom, you can see the different regions of the world. So you've got Latin America, North America, across to South Asia. So at a very simple level, you can see the largest amount of food flows to East Asia and Oceania, because that's where the most people live. And if you look at the per capita food, the smallest amount is flowing to Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, and unsurprisingly, the largest amounts to North America and Europe. But if we look at the types of food groups, so across on this far left-hand side, you've got the nutrient-rich foods. So these are animal source foods that have got micronutrients that our bodies need, but only in tiny quantities. And on the right-hand side, you've got these nutrient-poor foods. So they fill our bellies, but they don't have many nutrients. So these are starchy veg that either we've stripped them of all their nutrients or they tend to be low, lower density nutrients in the first place, like potatoes and white rice. What's alarming is that if you look at where these nutrient rich foods flow, they tend to flow to these countries in North America and Europe and Central and Asia, whereas the starchy veg, the nutrient poor foods tend to flow to Asia and South America. And in fact, 40% of the food that's available on markets in Sub-Saharan Africa is nutrient poor starchy vegetables. What this means, this difference in terms of how much is being eaten and what's, how much is being eaten, sorry, and what's being eaten in the different parts of the world. It means in some areas we're over consuming certain groups of foods and in other areas we're under consuming. So here again, you've got the starchy, you've got the groups of food, the starchy veg here at the top and the nutrient dense animal source foods at the top, bottom, sorry. And you've got the regions across the top. The dark boxes that you can see are places where foods are being overconsumed. So Sub-Saharan Africa is over-consuming by a thousand and over almost 2,000% too much starchy vegetables. Whereas in, sorry, um, North America and Europe, you can see these animal source foods are being overconsumed. And if we actually just look at how much we need to consume, so the thin bars at the bottom is today is what being produced in 2020, and the fat bars are what would we would need to consume if everything was distributed to where it needs to go, and even accounting for 30% waste and loss. So these patterns of overconsumption and underconsumption that plays out around the world results in nutrient gaps. So in particular, it's these micronutrients 
such as calcium, iron, vitamin A, vitamin B12, that our bodies need in tiny quantities that are essential for the first thousand days of life. Otherwise, it results in long-term um, loss of uh, de developmental delays, physical and mental developmental delays, and, 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 and uh, loss of early loss of life. And you can see across this work is by Ty Beale, and they looked at nine countries across sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, and they found by looking at what people, what children under five, two years old are eating in their diets, these major nutrient gaps. So that national level data that we look at from the FAO that shows us that foods are being distributed inefficiently, diets are over and under consuming key food groups, is then playing out in the diets down on the ground in these case studies. We're really looking at what children are getting. So this is where aquatic foods come in. Aquatic foods, like other animal source foods, are rich in these key micronutrients. They're also eaten all over the world. Aquatic foods, which are the fish, the invertebrates, um, the plants that grow in, in marine environments, but also in freshwater environments, all that are, that are cultivated, are rich in these key micronutrients. They're often culturally um, accessible, culturally available. Um, and distributed widely around the world. But unlike animal source foods, like cows or chicken, where we there's only one species of each, we regularly consume over a thousand different species of fish. And these fish live in different environments. They have different levels of energetic demands. They have different diets, all of which are likely to influence the nutrients that are in those fish and therefore the nutrients that are available to people when, when we consume them. So the first thing that we set out to do was try and gather all the information that we have, all the information that is out there in terms of fish nutrient profiles to see how much we do know. And if we don't know much about, if there are many data gaps, can we use the information that we do have to try and plug those gaps? So we went to the Web of Science, we went to the UN, who has a fantastic database. They've been compiling data on nutrient um, composition for, 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 for years and years. We went to the expert um, elicitation and also to grey literature. And we found thousands of entry points of data on, different, on, on approximately 610 different species of fish. We drew on ecological theories to try and develop hypotheses of what we thought was likely to influence the nutrient content in the different species of fish. So first, we looked at phylogeny. We, expect, we expected how closely related fish were to each other to affect their nutrient profile. We then expected various traits. So the environment that a fish lived in, so it, the the, where it lived geographically in the water column, its body shape that's likely to affect its energetic demand. So how fast it grows, to what age it grows, how big it grows. And then finally, its diet. And we collected all of this information from fish base and we developed a predictive model to, to tell us what nutrients are likely to be available in species of fish for which we don't have data. This data is now all available on fish base. So if you're working on fish consumption or anything to do with the nutrients available in fish around the world, you, wherever in the world you are, you can access this data from fish base, like with all the other variables that they have and, and develop your hypotheses or develop your policies. But to give you just some ideas of the kind of patterns that we found, we ran a Bayesian model a predictive a, a Bayesian model to try and understand the nutrient content using these three categories of diet, thermal regime, and energetic demand. We focused on seven key nutrients initially. So these are nutrients that we know are important to human health, but that we also know are commonly lacking in diets around the world and for which we had enough information available in the database. What we found 
was that we found calcium iron and zinc tended to be richer in small species and in species that were found in a tropical thermal regime, whereas omega-3 tended to be richer in pelagic spe species, sorry, that fed on a pelagic feeding pathway and that lived in polar thermal regimes. And when it came to protein, which is what most people think of when they think of fish, there was, there, there was some predictive ability. So higher trophic level species tend to have higher protein, but in practical terms, the effect was quite small, which means when it comes to protein, a fish is a fish. But when it comes to all the other micronutrients that are critical for development, it matters what types of fish you're eating. So this information was important both for public health advice, for fisheries management advice, but it also meant we could start to apply these models to what we already know is being consumed and we already know is being caught in the world's fisheries. And start to ask some of these socio-political questions that get at the heart of questions around food sovereignty and food security. Questions around who gets to eat, where is the food or where are the nutrients and, and what shapes access. So the first thing we did was, well, we looked at, well, how are nutrient rich catches distributed globally? And if you have a look at these four, six key nutrients, you can see that there's variation in where nutrient rich catches are. A lot of the countries around the tropics tend to be rich in zinc and iron, whereas around the Caribbean tends to be rich in zinc. This also meant that we can develop an understanding of the nutrient yields, both historically and then in order to project it into the future to try and understand what might happen. So the graph that you can see on the left-hand side is taken from the Sea Around Us database, which builds on F, uh, FAO data and fills in the data gaps to come, come up with the uncertainty, to come up with unreported catches. And what you can see, and this is a fairly common um, map, is that from the 1950s to around the mid 1990s, fish catches increased everywhere, after which they began to decline. But mariculture and also aquaculture, that's not shown here, made up for the differences. So fish catches pretty much. De declined slightly from the 1990s, but if you were to put in aquaculture, it continued to increase. On the right-hand side is what those catches look like if we're looking at the nutrients that are being pushed out of the waters. And there you can see a similar pattern, an increase in the nutrients across all. Here, we're looking at four different types of nutrients, so calcium, iron, omega-3, and protein, an increase until around the mid-1990s. But at that point, the catches, the yield didn't decline, it, it, it plateaued. So what this tells us is that we currently have, we're currently catching more nutrients than we've ever caught before. We also know that the rate of fish consumption on average has doubled since the 1960s. So we have more nutrients available from the sea and we're eating more nutrients from the sea. So if we look at, break that data down to look at the different countries that's available and reported in that data. And here I'm just gonna focus on two nutrients. So calcium on the left-hand side and iron on the right-hand side. And what you see up the y-axis is the yield of calcium. So how much calcium is being pulled out, is being caught in the world's, in the, in, in the different countries' EEZs. And on the right-hand side, how much iron each dot represents a country. The size of the dot represents how much food, fish, sorry, is consumed in that country. So the bigger the dot, the more fish is eaten. And the black line that you can see running horizontally is the point at which for that country, enough um, nutrients, either calcium or iron, are being pulled out of the water to meet the nutrient needs for the entire coastal population, so from 100 kilometers for the coast, under five years old. So it begins to tell us a little bit about the extent to which the nutrients in the water can meet the nutrient needs of the coastal population. And along the bottom axis, 
you've got a different measure, which is the prevalence of inadequate calcium intake. So countries on the left-hand side, there is sufficient calcium in their diets. And in the right-hand side, there's up to 100%. Their diets are lacking up to 100% of their, their nutrient needs. What's particularly alarming is that there are many countries that although the nutrient yields are above what's needed, they're still, the diets are still inadequate in those same um, nutrients. And some of the standout countries, um, bearing in mind that this is a log scale, are Kiribati and Namibia, where the diet, calcium dietary gap is 82% and iron is 47%. And it would only take between one and 5% of the fish that's currently caught in those countries' EEZs to close the nutrient gap for the entire coastal population under five years old. Similar pattern emerges for the other nutrients. And many of these countries that are in the top right-hand corner of these plots are, are happen to be uh, West African countries. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a little bit. So the availability of nutrients clearly isn't enough. There being nutrients, the right nutrients available in the right places, doesn't mean that those coastal populations can access those nutrients. So access is often talked about within food security, and access is often thought of as how affordable the different foods are. So we collaborated with a large project called the Illuminating Hidden Harvest, led out of FAO, World Fish, and Duke, that was trying to do a similar exercise to the Sea Around Us project to try and establish how much of what's being caught around the world do we not yet have a handle on. So really to, to get bigger, better figures on fish catches around the world. But what we were interested in was looking at their data to try and understand how affordable is the fish that's being caught in those countries by their small scale fisheries. So this figure that you can see on the left-hand side are the, just the different groups of fish that were reported. Along the bottom axis is a metric that's affordability of diet. So this tries to capture the idea of how affordable relative to other foods in that country, the food that we're interested in. So it's referred to as the cost of a 100 gram portion relative to the cheapest daily diet. So it's the cost of each group of fish, 100 grams of each group of fish, relative in this case to the three items in a state in, in, the, in a basket of food, three cheapest staple items. And it's this metric's now used in the FAO to calculate the affordability of diets. And they've calculated that 45% of the world is unable to afford a healthy diet. So affordability is clearly an issue in terms of people getting the right foods. But what we found here is that herrings, sardines and anchovies in particular are some of the cheapest forms of nutrient dense food available. They're, they're cheaper than other um, um, fish, other aquatic foods available, other fishes, fish groups available in those markets. They're also a fraction of the price of other foods available in each of those countries. And over on the right hand side, you can see how the affordability of, uh, uh, of, of this cheapest fish, in this case, sardine, varies across income group. And so it's those lowest low income countries where these small anchovies are in particular much uh, a, a very affordable source of, of, of food. So the foods are available in sufficient quantities, and they're often affordable in the places where they're needed most. So this perplexed us, you know, our food system is clearly failing us. And the common questions that we ask about why people aren't getting the foods, aren't giving us the answers. So this, so we, so this work, I collaborated with a colleague of mine, a friend of mine, um, and we went to Senegal to try and really understand what's happening because many of those countries in the top right hand corner were West African countries. And Senegal is known as a as a real as a as a as a 
a place where fish is central to people's diets, but also fishing is central to people's livelihoods. It's a rich, productive fishery. There's upwellings along the west coast of Africa um, and, and, and people in Senegal love to eat fish. But in Senegal, everywhere we went, we heard the same story. People were struggling to find fish. Every, we went up and down the coastline and it was the women processors who in particular would talk to us and they said that they were worried that their fish, the small sardines that they normally would buy and either process locally or sell on the local market was less affordable. And when it was affordable, well, sorry, or when it was available, it was too expensive for them to buy. And this is because along the West African coastline, you've had a series of fish meal factories springing up. This graph here is just from, um, it's just trade data from FAO stack collected by the United Nations and then consumption data for the West African region. And the blue line shows the export of fish meal and fish oil. And it's increased dramatically since 2010. And in the same period of time, consumption of fish in this region has become very, very variable. And this is different countries around the region. But in Senegal alone, where 80% of the diet, uh, sorry, 80% of um, animal source foods comes from fish, the amount of fish that people are consuming has halved in this time period. So the arrival of this new market, this new industry that brings valuable foreign exchange currency, both to the government, but also to the fishermen who are more likely to sell their fish to the fish meal factories because they're able to pay a higher price because they're connected to global markets than the local markets. It's having a profound impact on the food that's available um, in, in the local markets. So trade is clearly having a role in rerouting fish away from the places where fish is needed, where fish was cheap and available, but is now no longer so available. But foreign fishing is also has a huge role to play. So those early graphs that I showed you were really focused on what's being pulled out of the water or where it's being pulled out from the water, but not who's catching it. Um, so this work was led by Kirsty Nash, and in it, what we did was we wanted to look at the movement of both fish through foreign fishing and fish through trade. And here I'm just going to focus on the movement of fish through foreign fishing, partly because we found far more fish was moved through foreign fishing than was moved through trade. Even though we know that fish is one of the most traded food commodities globally. So large amounts of fish are traded, but more fish is moved around through foreign fishing. So just to talk you through this diagram here. So the black, you can see, sorry, the left-hand side is the source. So it's analogous to the first graphs I showed you. So where things are being caught. The right-hand graph is who's catching it and focusing on foreign fleets here. The red, the black bar, sorry, is the high seas. So the first thing that's apparent is lots of regions in the world get a lot of their fish from the high seas. The other bars are then color coded by the prevalence of inadequate nutrients in their diet. The light places are where diets are adequate. So diet, there are, there are very few nutrient gaps in those diets, whereas the darker orange bars are where there's a very high prevalence of inadequate nutrients in people's diets. So all regions do benefit from the movement of fish from the high seas and some movement from other places. But the regions that benefit the most, as you can see on this bar graph on the right hand side, are the places with very low prevalence of, under, of, 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 of inadequate nutrients in their diets. So foreign fishing is rerouting vast quantities of root nutrients around the world and that Everyone participates in that, but the greatest pull is towards those nutrient secure 
nations. And this unfolding story of trade and foreign fishing, moving nutrients away from where they're most needed towards where they're most, a, towards regions that are most able to pay, has impacts that extend far beyond the coastline of Senegal. So we traveled from the coastline and those first photos that I showed you towards Linger, which is a small town on the edge of the Furlow Desert where temperatures are in the 40s. Um, it's hot, it's dry, and it's incredibly hard to grow very much. There we went to the market and we met this lady and she had this basket of dried fish. And this was again, this basket of dried sardines that are prevalent and common in the diets of, 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 of Senegalese, in, in the Senegalese diets. And when we went to the malnutrition clinics in this area, where they were treating pregnant mothers and checking their children for malnutrition status, they were giving the mothers and fathers the same bits of advice. And it was to crumble up a little bit of this dried fish into the otherwise rice-based diets that these pastoralists were giving to their children. Because this was the only source of animal source food that they had access to in that region. And it was critical for supporting these mothers and fathers in lifting their children out of uh, malnutrition status. Unfortunately, these global processes of foreign fishing and trade are not the only things, I feel like I'm getting really, gonna, it's getting more and more depressing. I'm gonna try and come up at the end, I promise. So it's not only these global processes that are impacting the nutrients that are available. So this is some work that just came out last week, I think, that we did with William Chung, and where we'd looked at historical patterns in terms of where nutrients are, and we've, we've got established that actually we're in a better place now than we've ever been in terms of what nutrients are being caught and pulled out of the waters. But that's unlikely to hold into the future at least not from the marine environments. What we did is we looked at using two climate change scenarios, so SSP 2.5, which means we need to stick to the climate, the Paris climate targets, which we're not currently on track for. And then SSP 8.5, which is an absolute worst case scenario. And there's a significant difference between if we meet those targets and if we don't meet those targets. It's the difference on the right-hand side that you can see between over a 30% loss in nutrients at a global scale and an approximately 10% loss in nutrients at a global scale. So meeting those targets are really important. But what's more worrying from the type of work that we do is that if you split those trajectories up into the tropics and the extra tropical regions, then, and this is just using the 8.2 scenario, so the worst case scenario, the extra tropical regions losses are marginal and the majority of the losses are exper experienced in these tropical exclusive zones. So climate change is threatening nutrient supplies at a global scale, but the losses are predominantly coming from those regions where nutrient inadequacies are already of most concern. But if we, if we, um, we then looked at what would, what happens? What do those projections look like for every degree of additional warming? And you can see that again, every degree of additional warming will obviously lead to a greater amount of loss. But for every degree of warming, the gap between the losses experienced at a global scale and in those lower income countries widens. So the urgency for acting on climate is a global challenge, but it's also a real issue of equity. So even though, so the, so the urgency of action, of course is, is, is global and we all know that's global, but it's even more severe for the places that are already experiencing those greatest impacts. 
So we've seen that availability and accessibility is not sufficient and climate change is exacerbating the abilities of people to access the nutrients that they need. So what we wanted to do was dig a little bit deeper into the barriers. So drawing on ideas from social justice theory that posits injustices emerge because social, economic and political barriers exist that create distributional injustices, rep representational injustices, and recognitional injustices. We wanted to look at those barriers or look at indicators of those barriers and try and understand how that was affecting the benefits that different nations around the world received. So we looked across the whole aquatic food system this time. So I've been focusing very much on the production piece, how much is being caught, where it's being caught, and the nutrient density piece, how rich are those nutrients. But of course, the, fish, the aquatic food system involves the fishers, also involves the processors, it also involves the retailers, those who distribute the foods, generates economic revenues, it supports livelihoods. So we looked at eight different components of the aquatic food sectors. Um, how much is being caught? how many livelihoods overall and for women are supported, the density of those aquatic foods, the economic benefits being generated in terms of exports, the affordability on local markets, um, how much is being consumed, and then reliance. So reliance is a measure of how important to those local diets the consumption is. So consumption is just a total amount that's being consumed, whereas reliance is relative to other animal source foods. So if a place eats, drink, eats 10 grams of fish and they have no other animal source foods available in those diets, so they have fewer sources of those key micronutrients, those 10 grams are very, very important. They're very reliant on it. But if they have eat the same amount, 10 grams of fish per person, but they also have access to milk, access to cheese, access to eggs, chickens, and beef, then that 10 grams is less important. Those countries are less reliant on that aquatic food. And we looked at two indicators of economic barriers, so education and wealth. We looked at four indicators that captured the idea of social barriers, so gender equality, linguistic diversity, a measure of cultural hegemony, and which captures the extent to which um, a country is being influenced by other cultures. Uh, age dependency, and then one indicator of a political barrier, so levels of voice and accountability. What we found was that in countries that tended to have a higher levels of formal education and higher levels, higher reported levels of voice and accountability. Production, so the amount that was being produced tended to be more. Exports generated tended to be more and the amount that was consumed tended to be more. So these really represented these wealth generating benefits tended to exist where these economic and political barriers were lower. Conversely, where these barriers existed, so levels of ed formal education were lower, reported measures of voice and accountability were lower, more livelihoods were supported, nutrients tended to be more dense, but countries also were more reliant on those foods. So this suggested that there was a, these economic and political barriers were likely limiting the abilities of countries to benefit from these wealth generating benefits, but they also created the need for welfare based benefits. Looking at the key, the social barriers, we found that where life, where, where linguistic diversity and gender equality was greater, livelihoods, more livelihoods were supported, but in particular where gender equality was greater, aquatic foods tended to be more affordable. Whereas where linguistic diversity was lower, 
countries tended to export less. So this suggested that these social barriers limited welfare-based benefits, but they allowed wealth-based benefits to grow. So this suggests that these welfare-based benefits meant that for far too many, because of these barriers, for far too many, food is a human right that's not afforded to them. These barriers, there are barriers to accessing the benefits from aquatic foods. Meanwhile, for others, our food system continues to support the vast, the accumulation of vast quantities of wealth. So we wanted to look at these countries that we'd seen these indications of potential barriers to see whether they were policies, whether policies were buffering or ameliorating the trade-offs that we saw. So we identified places from the quantitative analysis that looked like they were doing better than what the model predicted. So we call these, so these bright spots, they're drawing on a sort of positive deviance approach. So these bright spots are places where fish was, for example, more affordable and consumption was higher despite the presence of social and economic barriers. So despite gender equality being an issue and poverty being a challenge. We also identified places that were doing worse than expected. So these dark spots. So for example, where fish was less affordable and where consumption was far lower. We were more interested in the bright spots, but we needed to also look at where things were going worse than expected. And we gathered all of the policies or the most recent policies that we could find for every country, um, their food and aquaculture policies, but also their fish, sorry, their food and nutrition policies, but also their food and aquaculture policies. And we looked for key, we, we looked for measures of these key barriers that we were interested in. And then we pulled out from these bright spot countries and we scanned all of the documents to try and understand what were the policies that were at least at a, in place at a national scale that might have been leading to more beneficial outcomes. And what we found was the policies that tended to be doing better than we than expected acknowledged social difference. So there was explicit mention in those policies that social difference mattered, that structural barriers existed, and that challenges were intersectional. They also centered principles of justice, equity, and human rights. In converse, the policies that were dark spots tended not to recognize social difference, often wouldn't even mention women at all within, um, wouldn't even recognize women at all. There was no mention of them. And the policies where they did engage with issues of social difference would inadvertently place the blame on the disadvantaged for replic, for example, for replicating or perpetuating um, this, this, this systems, the, the, the processes they were in. These policies also tended to state what, to whom, and how redistribution applies. So redistributive dis policies were really common. Policies often would lay out ways of, of, of providing support in the form of uh, economic support in the form of grants. Um, or preferential access to certain areas. Um, and the better places would state, be very specific about those policies, so for who they were, um, but also why. They clearly articulated the context of how the structural barriers drive injustices. So, so um, it was informative, but also it strove to drive, to avoid bias. And it broadened the responsibility of change. So for example, improving nutritional status was the responsibility of men and women. Um, fine. And also these policies tended to highlight the importance of political voice and representation and really elevated them as core principles to be protected. They committed to downward accountability. And they also had specific processes that outlined equitable decision-making processes. Whereas the dark, in many cases, we found very little text in the policies in the dark spots because these issues were not mentioned or not touched upon. So just to sum up, we do produce 
enough food, often in the places where it's most needed. But flaws in our food system create inequities that harm both people and planet because it pushes us to overproduce in the places where we don't need the food and underproduce for the places where we do. But there is a need for policies to center these principles of justice and to put food before profit and trade. In many cases, we know what to do. We know we need to decarbonize. We know we need to phase out fishery subsidies and we're doing that, but we do just need to do more. For example, the recent fishery subsidies agreements go some way towards recognizing the inequitable distribution of subsidies, but it doesn't go anywhere near enough. It gives far too much leeway for the countries that have historically been fishing to continue to fish. And we also need to be bold and at times radical to build not to undermine agency, food and nutrition security. I'd like to end there. Thank you very much and just acknowledge that a lot of this work came out of my uh, an ERC grant that I uh, um, received a few years ago. So it's a very collaborative project, but also has been the work of collaborations with lots of people that I've worked with over the years. Um, thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Christina. So we'll open it up to questions now. Yeah, um, thank you. I loved your presentation. Um, I was keen to note that uh, you, uh, your research didn't really speak about how safe is healthy. Like how safe is the fish? Probably, yes, we're going to, to give, you know, uh, make the policies favorable for people, women also included. But now how safe is the fish, you know, from microplastics, from heavy metals? Because at the end of the day, you might feed people, but again, you're killing them slowly. Yeah. Thank you. That's a, I mean, that, that's a really important topic and a really important issue. Remember when we started this work to manage it, I think, I guess part, partly because there was, at, when we started, more work on contaminants and um, in, in seafood. And so our focus really was on, on the nutrients and the, and, the, and the benefits of seafood. But um, a number of the people that I work with and the, the work that overlaps does look at food safety. I think you mentioned microplastics, which is a very recent and emergent challenge. But in many of the places that I talked about, um, fish is dried and it's smoked and lots of kind of pollutants are introduced in that way. So there is a lot of work happening in that space and it is really, really critical. So thank you for raising that issue. Um, but, but it hasn't been the focus here. One challenge maybe that I'll say is that often in the context that I, work, that I work in, the food safety standards are geared towards export markets. So they, there's, the resources tend to be diverted towards meeting safety standards for export, which are not necessarily the greatest safety concerns in, in the domestic countries where the, where the fish is being consumed. So yeah, yeah sorry. Great, thank you. Oh yeah, um, I was really interested in your analysis of the food policies, food and nutrition policies, and I'm wondering about how, uh, have you done some work to try to disentangle the kind of correlation and causation and the extent to which good policies are made by good governance and also, you know, good healthy nutrition is made by good governance and the extent to which there are levers that you can actually pull that would change things in these countries or is it all driven by external forces? Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think, um, so I think maybe one thing that you pick up on there is the fact that we look very much at the kind of institutional architecture. So the policies that are in place, and that doesn't necessarily mean that those policies are playing out on the ground. Um, it, it, and that could work both ways. You could have much better practices or you could have much worse practices. I think because we did this during COVID <laughs> from a computer, um, that was the focus, but we, I guess our entry point was that the institutional architecture is necessary, but not sufficient. And I think, so the institutional architecture can do exactly what you said, can can create the conditions to, for more supportive practices. It can also undermine it 
if it doesn't recognize um, or undermines practices that are happening. So, so I am very aware that actually the next step is really to 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 go down and drill what into what's actually happening. But I think the high levelness of the kind of stuff that came out resonated with the work that we have all done in that the authors had done in the different places that they work and um and the fact that it's it's about recognizing people and centering equity so it wasn't kind of the technical aspects of the policies but more like the sort of almost values and principles in those policies that we focused on Thank you very much for that. That was really interesting. Um, I had a question about the processing mm -hmm. and particularly in places where there's no refrigeration and people more likely to dry or smoke their fish. Mm -hmm. Does that have an impact on the nutrient sort of the uh, bioavailability or anything like that? And subsequently sort of the beneficial impact of eating it for especially poorer communities? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's, it's something that we're, we're looking into now. Um, and it's not it's not straightforward. So some nutrients, the drying, it doesn't degrade the nutrients. So all you do is you're losing water, which means actually you've got a more concentrated package of, 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 of fish. So it's actually more, but it's a really good source, particularly of the minerals. Some nutrients, because of the nature of the nutrients, for example, the minerals, they degrade. But uh, yeah, so I'm, I, that is a question that we're, we're actively looking looking into, but it's I think I think by and large drying, particularly for some nutrients, is it's not a bad thing and it's possibly a good thing. But the pollutant issue is the introduction of contaminants is the challenge. Thank you. I was wondering about this um, tropical extra tropical divergence of nutrient availability and how that might interact with policy. Um, so particularly thinking about fisheries moving into places like the Arctic, where there is a completely different governance structure, but also where the bright spots and dark spots of governance interplay. Do you think that there is a likelihood or even the possibility of good governance uh, mitigating the impact of this divergence between tropical tropics and extra tropics? Or do you think it would compound those differences and make it worse? Um, so with the existing flows from the tropics to other areas be compounded under yeah. changing nutrient regime i think it's not impossible that it could um be, be beneficial i don't think that's the way we're headed at the moment um i guess maybe the, the high seas treaty that was signed last year is kind of i guess an attempt to try and protect some of those waters that the fish are going to be moving into but it it's it's a it's a for, for for good reasons it's um it's for the conservation of the species it's not yet and so it's to not exacerbate the inequities to make sure that those countries who have the capacity to go and um, exploit those stocks don't rush in and exploit it and those stocks so there is a slight equity issue there but it's not going to redistribution for example but it is possible i think that trade policies could be could be more equitable and could work could work with 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 climate changes with climate yeah could could work <laughs> i think if we we just need to get the current system <laughs> a little bit fairer which isn't impossible and then i think we could it could be beneficial for the future Thank you so much, Christina. So I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit more about the peculiarities associated to freshwater ecosystems. Yeah, so I mostly didn't focus on freshwater. So when we looked at the policies and the kind of whole aquatic food system, we included freshwater in there. But most of this, I, I didn't talk about freshwater. And again, that's because of my entry point has been through fisheries. Um, freshwater, data on freshwater systems is far less um, there's less data, so there are more data gaps. Um, depending on the region, freshwater is far more important for, for fish, fisheries and people's diets. So, for example, in, sub in across Africa, freshwater is much more important than marine fisheries because you've got the Great Lakes. Um, I think freshwater systems that um, I'm not sure. Some yeah, freshwater systems are much more 
So aquaculture systems have often developed um, adjacent to freshwater or within freshwater systems. So you have like a whole continuum. So there's more scope for aquaculture development within freshwater systems that's not completely industrial. Um, so I don't know if that really gets, in terms of nutrients, um, the profiles are similar, um, except for omega-3s. So omega-3s are much, much richer in marine fishes than in aqua, uh, than in freshwater fishes. I don't know if that gets it, it yeah. Yeah, it does, yeah. Uh, fr you. Freshwater tend to be more smaller scale, whereas you get more industrial fisheries and marine systems. Um, but there, it is, it's definitely an area that people are, are highlighting we keep overlooking. There are lots of areas that we keep overlooking, but freshwater systems is one. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. And th thanks for a really, I don't know, sort of really fresh and up-to-date look at this uh, topic. I'm a terrestrial scientist so although I spent a lot of time on the coast it's nice to be able to think about it properly for, or in an organized way but I actually wanted to get into a little bit of a conceptual bit on the talk so where you came up with your um, uh, framework for social access yeah. uh, on it this is very interesting to me because I've actually just spent the whole afternoon working with that framework in a different context of it and it I think these these frameworks where you identify what the dimensions are of a of a system in this case and then you identify the metrics or the elements to measure that yeah. they're really well structured frameworks but the whole when i'm working with them i'm constantly aware that they're actually a framework which tells a narrative mm -hmm. and, and it is a narrative framework mm -hmm. on it yeah. and then as part of that not only does it construct a narrative it actually represents things within that yeah. narrative uh, on it so they're quite the powerful tools to use on it. So my question here is, and I think this is the an interesting one between the natural sciences and the social sciences. So because I'm dealing with ecosystems in this, the science is always speaking back to me on that narrative. I have to co-design that narrative, mm -hmm. you know, that framework yeah. with the science challenging me back. But as a social scientist, how do you how do you get that challenge back to you here, such that you avoid the situation where you you design that in the narrative you've come into it of justice. Mm -hmm. So it confirms the narrative. It confirms the established narrative, which is already there. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm getting at here? How, how do you get that check in, in there? So that it, critical check on the choice of those dimensions and then the choice of the, the bits you decide to measure those dimensions with it. So if I understand you correctly, and please correct me. Uh, yeah, correct me. <laughs> So are you asking how do I avoid essentially self uh, yeah, you know, self yeah self confirming self confirming um, how you, how you go into the research you yeah. then confirm your proposition of what you went into and because it's it's a, it's a weakness of those yeah that framework design and yet it's also a real strength of the framework design yeah well I I mean I guess um, so I work at both scales. I work with sort of global data sets in a sort of more scientific framing. And then I work very much with case studies. And I guess I use those global data sets to, to ask, is what we are seeing and sensing in different places at that very um, fine scale, is that replicated at a global scale? And then it's also in part to communicate to across disciplines, because it's a lot harder, I think, to um, communicate that narrative, to tell that story of what's happening in Linguer, for example, and have that be influenced and picked up at, um, in policy because it's a case study. So I I would say that I think in the same, I, it was, you're still asking a question. You have a hypothesis, although we don't like to use that language. And then we're gathering these indicators and we're seeing whether those indicators tell us what we expected to see. So in some ways it is self-confirming the assumptions that we went in with, but those assumptions are built on established theory and they, they, they are, they're not kind of just, they're not picked, I guess, if that makes sense. And so 
I probably wouldn't, well, I would not send that paper to a social science journal because it wouldn't really be new or novel. It would be, well, reductive, I guess. But I guess I see the value in it in being able to reduce the complexity and communicate across disciplines. Does yeah. that? Does that? Yeah, it, it wasn't in any way a, a criticism. It's yeah, just, it's just a real struggle at the moment yeah. when we're sort of representing complex realities, and and the categories we do that in. So yeah. it's really just a reflection on it. Yeah. I think I do think it's that that narrowing it down. Like you don't you don't start with that indicator because starting with that indicator would be, would be wrong, but that indicator captures so much complexity that's already been, I think, evaluated and agreed on. And if that, mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. Okay, if we have one more question in the room. Um, all right, and then we'll switch to an online question after that. So thank you very much, it was very clear. And I think you certainly showed how interdisciplinary these problems are. I was just curious in terms of um, global food production and the fact that uh, aquatic systems are somewhere in the middle in terms of the energy and nutrients that you get out compared to a lot of animal production and plant production. For the communities that you're looking at, uh, are fisheries becoming more important in their diet or less important compared to say uh, terrestrial animals or plants? Um, I mean, to what extent is this moving towards more and more aquatic uh, sources of nutrients or are they becoming less important in these communities? Um, less important because they're being replaced by by other sources. Um, I think the places that I've worked on, they're, they're becoming more more important. Um, I mean, it's it's difficult because you've got that whole sort of dietary shift unfolding linked to urbanization and so you kind of have I guess I try and think of it as their really importance in diets today and yes people are going to get access to other forms of food but actually the forms of food that people tend to first get access to are more of these kind of starchy nutrient poor foods so so that the, the fish sort of loses depending on the like income level the fish loses maybe its importance in the diet because people's bellies are being filled by starchy, sugary foods, because that's what's available on the market. And when your incomes initially start to rise, that's what you then start buying, because it's convenient, because it's easy to so package noodles and things like that. Um, you've also got the other end of the spectrum where you've got diets, uh, incomes are growing, and 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 fish becomes less important and people transition to to red meats so that transition's happening quite quickly but so that so it's it's quite a both i think unfortunately are problematic from a dietary perspective and 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 also likely from a um from from an environmental perspective but i don't you're not really seeing the transition towards a healthier diet yet so it becomes fish becomes less important in terms of the content perhaps but then diets probably dietary quality may may be impacted in the interim until people are able to to to, to afford much healthier diets thanks everyone so i'm going to hand it over to Stephen. Uh, there's two questions online and then we'll continue the conversations next door for those of you who want to join us for different um, hi, yep. So a uh, fascinating talk and lots of interest online. So Daniel asks, um, how fair are marine conservation zones? Hmm. <laughs> um, well, you know, I guess they're not um they're not homogenous, homogeneous, are they? They um they can be very unfair, just like on land. They can exclude people, they can um um rob people of their livelihoods and their sources of food, but they can also be a really important form of the marine landscape. Um, many communities have traditional customary forms of essentially marine protected areas. So in the Pacific, you have tr tambus, traditional temporary closures that are not necessarily for conservation, but people do say that they can have conservation benefit. Along the Kenyan coastline with the devolution of governance, you've had these tengefus springing up, which are these community-led closures and those are for conservation conservation and 
and potential um, recreation. So they can be unfair, but they don't need to be unfair if they recognize the existing systems of governance at a local level and they work with communities. Okay, thank you. And final question from Marcus, which is, what do you think needs investigating next in this area? Or sorry, most most needs investigating next in this area? Yeah, I think so. I think you can go in two directions. You can go, there's obviously lots of, I think some of the questions picked up on the need to actually have more of a fine scale understanding of what's happening on the ground. So that definitely needs to happen. Looking at questions of food safety, looking at how kind of different processing affects the nutrients available, looking at the the potential for other forms like aquaculture to supplement people's diets but I think I want to go even higher <laughs> and I'm more interested in looking at those what what are those global macro scale drivers who who controls them where is the kind of centers of power and and that's driving the exploitation so I think I'm going to go even higher whereas I think you need to go in both directions Absolutely. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, Christina. Thank you.